expect when they're drunk at the bar. <laughs> you need live updates. People don't want to sit there refreshing. They want the right price right now. They want to know the score right now. And that's not just for customers, obviously. Traders need all of that, plus more, because they need to see what bets are coming in. They need to see what their current position is. They, they, they need even more information, and they need to be able to update it. And the approach we picked was single-page web applications, because I was a Java developer. I hate writing Swing, and uh, customers don't want to download an applet or anything like that anyway. Um, so this is basically what it looks like. You have a trader who sits there watching TV, the fastest aspect feed he can get, and he plugs in score updates, uh, price changes. He sits there watching all the bets coming in, rejecting them or accepting them. And just, you know, he sits there watching TV. There's also feeds that help him. If he's too lazy to hit that somebody's just scored, you can integrate into a feed instead. The customer, on the other hand, he sits also watching TV at home or in a bar. He gets all these updates coming in and places bets, hopefully. So it's written in HTML and Comet. Uh, we'd seen Flash interfaces, and they seemed to grind everybody's computer to a halt. It was just horrible, so we didn't want to go there. Uh, like I said, it works on desktop and mobile. That's even actually the trader interface, although they'd have to be a little bit insane to try and trade a match on an iPad or an iPhone. But it is useful for if you want to see how a match is going, you can go look at the liability yourself and, and feel either down or encouraged. Um, every web page is made up of an, uh, a set of independently updating areas, updated with Comet. Uh, I'll show you which areas those are in a moment. And in those areas, there might be personalized data for a customer, or there might be data that absolutely everybody sees. For the customer, it's read-only, apart from placing bets. So this is what it is. Each red box is a separately updating comment area. So that's one, two, three, four, five different areas. There's a message bar on the left that might have personal messages, that, might, that has all the bets they've placed, that has any news coming on from the game. At the very top, there's another little message bar that we use so that we can uh, cross-pollinate. So if there's other games on, messages come up from those other games. Behind, below that's a, a diary, a schedule, showing you upcoming games, showing the scores of any games that are on right now, or what the scores were if they've just finished. Then the, the scoreboard to your current game, and then the, the important bit, all the odd speeds, all the things that you can bet on right now. And that's probably the most active bit, because you have price changes, you have uh, over under price, over under changes. Things are already always coming up and down, being hidden, being shown, being disabled, being re-enabled. That's that's an extremely active area. For the trader, there's even more bits that update because oh, we've also got, like I said, the bet ticker, which shows you every single bet coming in, liabilities updates. Because as the bet comes in, you need to keep track of how much money's been staked, how much that means you might potentially owe. Score changes, if you've got feeds, then score changes will be coming in. Or if you're two traders trading one match, you'll both be doing updates, and that'll be being pushed to each other. And for them, it's all read-write. They need to be able to change scores. They need to be able to change prices. They need to be able to accept and reject bets. It's also super time critical. If, uh, if somebody scores, you need to take down all the right matches, all the right opportunities to bet right now. Everything needs to be done instantly, and if it's not going to be done instantly, the trader has to know about it. So on the trading back end, you can see there's a few more updating areas. And, th and this one at the bottom is uh, the same as the customers. It's, uh, this is where they update all their prices. So whilst it looks like one area, it's not exactly. It, it, the, it, things will come into separate bits of it a lot. Um, bet ticker over on the right hand side, scoreboards, all, all the bits and pieces you need to run a game. So the setup we did, and this was three years ago now, was Postgres on the back end, Scala and Lyft. Uh, Lyft's a framework that makes 
writing web applications in Scala really quite easy. So they, it has its own little ORM built in that it calls Mapper. It has very easy ways of writing REST um, services. And Comet is very, very easy in, in REST. That's one of the, uh, in Lyft. That's one of the reasons we picked it. It's super easy. We use quite a few actors. In Lyft, you, you, the actors are how Comet is implemented. And I, if you don't know what an actor is, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Because we knew we had to be fast, we used throwaway app servers and databases. And what, what I mean is when you want to run a new game, you run up a, you literally spin up a new, a new app server, which populates its own new database. The advantage is every single query is super fast. Disadvantage is at the end of that game, to keep your data, you need to then export it back to some master archive, which is a bit, it, it works just fine. It's, it's nice, but it, it does mean that you have kind of a, a behemoth slowly growing at the back that you try not to think about while your front end still runs fast. And this was how it worked. So the trade makes an update, it puts it into Postgres, and then it, set, then it sends it to this singleton actor, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is just a relay box, which forwards it on to all the Comet actors that are listening, which then send a jQuery update, which updates the front end. Oh, I'm going to start this, this slide backwards. The front end, when you load it up, actually gets a brand new Comet actor assigned to it, and uh, the Comet actor says, here you go, this is a chunk of HTML to show in your little, in this little box you've requested. And then the jQuery update would just update little numbers. So it'd update, say, just the score, or it'd add and remove classes to say we'd moved from first quarter to second quarter. So an actor is just a lump of code with a message box. Um, it's different from, from say, it's a little bit different from an object because you mustn't talk to it directly. You mustn't be calling the methods on it because things will get all out of sync. The advantage of them is that you can park your actor wherever you like. Maybe it's in the same VM as you, maybe it's elsewhere, and there's some software called Acker in Scala that a lot of people use to do that. But it means you can distribute. They're little, little units, and you can have as many of them as you like. So they're just tiny little objects with a message box. And when you send a message, you can wait synchronously for an answer, or you might just send a fire and forget a message, or you might fire a message and then asynchronously wait for something to come back. Well, you wouldn't wait if it was asynchronous, but... And it was good. It worked. Hundreds of customers didn't even touch the sides on, the, on just cheap servers. In fact, we ran it up on all the laptops in the house, and it, it was, wasn't even puffing, having 200 people washing the page and placing bets. It's not really... It, it, it was great. But... We wanted to take it up so it could support thousands of people watching and placing bets. And one of the big drivers for that is banners. You want to be able to advertise, and if you can make those banners interesting with prices and with uh, score updates, then you're going to get more people coming through. But if you're going to be serving advert banners out everywhere, you need to be able to support a lot more than a couple of hundred people. So we looked at Redis which is a super fast key value store, although that doesn't really say everything that Redis can do. It's got all sorts of bits as well, so it's got a publish and subscribe functionality, it's got uh, well, everything I've got written there. The sets, the sorted sets, and all the operations you need to do things to combine them, to diff them, to even take a random number out of them. I mean, you can even take a random key out of the entire database if that's something you particularly need. Key expiry. So at the moment, when I shut down a, a, an app application, I have to empty out the database and delete everything. With Redis, I could just set it all to expire after, after a day or so, and I wouldn't even have to think about it. It's a bit lazy, but it also saves you making mistakes. Clients in most languages that you might need, and uh, that's the one we use. It's very nice. It's uh, not really much to say about a client, really. So this was the slightly improved version. We still update straight to Postgres. 
Uh, but, the, the, but now what we also do is ask that singleton actor, the, the junction box, to render the HTML for us. Just, just render all that HTML again, because it's normally a, a tiny little snippet, and push it into Redis. Then the comet actors, whether it's for the initial render or because they've just received a message that something's changed, just grab that pre-rendered stuff out of Redis and directly replace it. Um, that's the simplest one. If it was for the message bar, they'd probably grab all sorts of snippets out of Redis so they can re-render because there might be private messages that they need to combine with public messages. And that was really, really good. Now, basically, sending an update was free. It was super fast for the, for the client. Uh, I haven't got it on here, but the, the jQuery updates took about 180 milliseconds for a client to do. This took 20. It was much, much faster. Um, and it me meant that now all the thinking was done at point of update rather than for every single Comet actor listening. It took it out of the critical path. But it was only half the job because that's only the stuff that you're reading. And we also want to be able to write. We also want people, thousands of people to be able to place bets. We don't just want them to be able to see the prices. Oh, and the second thing I forgot to say, if you're pushing these pre-rendered snippets, when we had our customers who wanted to integrate with us, we had a few of them that wanted to be able to have these sections on their page, the diary or uh, a scoreboard on one of their pages. And for us, that meant they, they called a RESTful interface, and then they had to kind of reproduce what our one looked like on their website, and it was just a bit clunky. So if we made an update, we'd have to synchronize our release with theirs so it all looked nice but now they could just grab the same stuff straight from Redis we can do a pub sub or some other way of flagging to them that they need to do an update now and they can just grab it straight from Redis identical to ours we have control of it still awesome in fact the, it was no problem what they were running we had people running .NET and we're running Scala and it perfect so we looked at what we had and we went, well, nobody's paying us to make it any better right now. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next thing. Uh, so our next project is to write a fully featured sports book. In play, plugged into somebody's existing sports book. So it used all their existing accounting functionality. And we just sat on the side and passed money back and forth. Um, well, we think we're quite good at this. We want to write the full suite now. We want to be the account. We want to have all the, we call it pre-match, so all the long-term betting. If you want to bet on next year's Grand National, that kind of thing, we want to be able to support that. Um, and we thought, we've done all this in play. We're going to make this even better now. We've got the experience. So what do we want to change? I liked the throwaway databases and app servers. I thought that really helped with performance. It meant things never got uh, full of, of rubbish. It meant that if mid-game we noticed something that wasn't quite right, we could do a hot fix and deploy it for the next game. Because all the, serve, all, all the games running were independent. So even if they were running five games that night that all overlapped, as soon as we noticed it, we could fix that for any game going on, going on after. And it meant that if we did want something special just for one game, we could deploy it in a a little branched web app, and it didn't have to affect anybody else, and we could put it straight back again afterwards. So Redis, perfect for the live data. It's fast putting stuff in, it's fast pulling stuff out, it's got all the sets and everything you need to be able to index and pull out the data how you want it. But it's no good for the historical. It's, it's, that's just not going to work. What do you want to do on historical data? Redis isn't so great at. And because it's largely in memory, it's not going to work because the data is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as the years go by. And the other thing, but, but another thing that I liked was this, this moving everything out of the critical path, being able to distribute when stuff happened. Uh, and they're, they're easy to test because they're a tiny amount of code. Um, you can distribute them. The last bit is the bit that really that I really love. 
the business intelligence possibilities suddenly explode in your mind. You're going, I don't actually have to write a report to find out who placed a bet on Tuesday who, whose name was Bob. Now I can just run up a little actor that's just going to sit there and, and count. And any time I want to know what it is, I just ask Bob. I ask this little actor, how many people placed that bet? And I know. Suddenly, anything that I can listen to, I can count. So I can make decisions on, I can report on. And that's pretty amazing, especially for marketers. They, they love the idea that suddenly they can have anything they like. Live. So that led me, after a bit of reading around it, to event sourcing, which is flipping how things work. So the way things worked before, when I was just using Postgres, was I'd update Postgres, and that's, that's kind of all I knew. I could keep a log, so I knew that changes had happened. But all I really knew right now was what was in Postgres. Event sourcing flips that over. So the log is what I store. I store all the things I did. And then to find out what I should be now, I, can, I, I kind of read through the log, add them all up, and, and that says what I should be right now. It is, it get, once, you start, once you're there, you go, oh, right, I get it. Obviously, oh, let me go back. Obviously, you, you don't actually want to add them up each time because that would be a bit slow. So that's where Redis comes in. Redis holds a live world. It knows what everything is right now. Meanwhile, all the events get stored in something more reliable, more slow. So you've kind of neatly split up your writing and your reading, and you can put them both in databases that are appropriate for those purposes. Ah, this is what I'm saying. So, so we use something called React, which is a, a distributed, fault-tolerant, really resilient database. It, it, it's hard to make it go down. And that's where we put all our events. We know they're safe. We know that if something horrible happens to Redis, we can just replay all these events and get ourselves back to where Redis should be. Um, uh, like I said, because we've got these act because we're running events, that means basically we can count anything we like. There's never any more long queries. So like I was saying, we need to keep count of where our liability was at. Previously, you'd have run a table. You'd have gone, for every single bet on this contest, add up the liability, please, and give me an answer. Uh, and that's what everybody does. I don't need to do that anymore. Everything's evented. So I have an actor that just sits there listening for bets on that contest and adds it up and holds it in Redis. So any time I want that, I no longer have to do a big, long sum. I pull the, n the number straight from Redis. And as a bonus, I get full audit and time travel and what ifs. So I want to know who did what when. I go straight to my events database and I can say exactly what he did then, what it looked like before, what it looked like after. I can say what was our world like at, at 3 p.m. last week on Tuesday because I can just run through all the events and go that's what it was like. And I can do what ifs. So when people want to run bonuses, which is uh, how we uh, encourage people to, to deposit money, I can say, well, if you had offered this bonus that was, you know, for people called Bob that plays bets on a Tuesday, this is what it would have cost you last week. And before, that can be quite difficult to do because you've got to write some report. And I've had to write three or four stage reports with manual intervention for whatever crazy bonus scheme somebody's currently thought up. Um, and we keep the Redis data set small. Sorry, Helen. Time up, sorry. Keep the red data set, data set small by only loading in uh, what you need. So don't load in the customer's details all the time. Just do it when they uh, log in. And because I've got evented systems, I can do that. I know that when this event happens, load this into Redis. Now, I've run out of time. I've got some more slides, but if somebody wants to see it, I'll, I'll upload them and you can look at them later. So that's it, I guess. <laughs>